thank you everyone for attending my talk. I thought I was going to have to fly 34 hours and have nobody sort of sit here. And that would have been sort of mostly tragic for me and maybe a little bit sad. Um, so my name's John. Um, I'm going to be talking um, about our latest project, Project Athena, where we're looking to sort of uh, blow open the lid on defense uh, sort of information, defense and military information, particularly with the focus on Africa, because, you know, we're all um, African Defense Review, all four of us or sort of all five of us involved with it are Africans and it's our sort of wheelhouse and our sort of um, sort of area of expertise. Um, we do sort of leverage a other team of researchers but for all intents and purposes it's the five of us. Um, I should say having seen and attended some of these talks now I am a journalist first and foremost so the you know I'm not a developer they're actually two of my my colleagues are my brother and the other director are actually um, the the developers who have developed the platform and dashboard that we're working on. Hopefully I can answer some of your questions if you have questions about the software itself um, but if I sound like an idiot about that when I do give the answers uh, just know that's coming from a place of complete and utter ignorance um, <laughs> So what, what am I doing with all this? Um, we're attempting to create a dashboard that's going to create a layer of transparency in the African defense sector. Um, there's very little transparency in the sector um, at the best of times. I mean, those of you who work or even sort of, you know, tangentially sort of related or sort of interested in defense affairs, even in the United States, there's a lot of secrecy over this and it's even more so and compounded so in Africa. Um, the defense sector is the least open worldwide and Africa is the the least open of that least open sector um, you know and that creates a massive massive um, sort of fog of war if you will um, on terms of uh, sort of a lack of information a creation of secrecy and thus a sort of vulnerability to corruption to arms pr proliferation um, and sort of illegal trafficking um, so we're essentially trying to break open that lid on defense data make it open make an open source platform where we can sort of look at who is selling what to whom and where are these arms going? Those are two of the sort of fundamental questions. Um, the consequences of this, um, of not doing this, I should say, are pretty obvious. I mean, the, the, the inability to accurately measure or catalog or, or sort of find this information can essentially be measured in human lives, which I'll sort of be getting, touching on a little bit um, as I go. Just a little brief content warning, in case you hadn't noticed, we're doing defense stuff here. There's going to be images of war zones, um, of conflict hardship. Um, you know, there will be some military equipment, guns and tanks and things like that. Um, nothing graphic in terms of sort of graphic or gratuitous violence, um, but just, uh, just a sort of heads up as we go. So I'll just start right here. Um, this right here is a tank, but it's a specific tank. As you can see in the top left, it's a Vickers Mark I main battle tank. And it was produced in the United Kingdom by BAE Land Systems way back when in the 1980s. Nigeria bought 36 of these in 1981 um, at a price in sort of today's dollars of 9 million per, per tank. Not a bad price, um, but 36 of these were bought back then. And um, this has a major significance. I'm going to use the tank as a vehicle, excuse the pun, of transporting you through how we're going to develop Project Athena. Um, because this tank actually is essentially the, the sort of uh, um, the main way that we kind of explain what we at ADR are going to do, or are doing, I should say. Um, so how am I going to do this? We've got this tank, and we're going to sort of talk about it in two major silos. Okay, the first we're going to talk about um, the sort of Minesweeper approach. Those of you who played Minesweeper back in the day, or still do, uh, will know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't, we'll get there, don't worry. Um, and that will relate to the sort of state-centric side of the defense research we're doing. Um, and then we have the scratch patch uh, side of things, which I'm very curious to see if any of you know what a scratch patch actually is but again we'll get there as we go um, and then finally I'll look at the actual tech of what we're doing and how all this information is going to be sort of placed into something that can slice and dice this information into a useful and coherent fashion um, for for pretty much anybody who's interested mostly we're aiming this at journalists at humanitarian organizations um, who would or should or need to know about these kinds of risks in terms of the areas of where they're going in terms of corruption risks um, and so on. So that's what we're going to do. So with this Vickers Mark I main battle tank, on the left hand side here we got the, the nice sort of shiny version of it in the Nigerian army's uh, warehouse. Um, those are obviously just, what have we got there? We've got uh, four. 
of the 36 sitting in their warehouse. What we have on the right is exactly the same tank, um, but it's, this is a photo captured, uh, sort of it's, it's been recaptured from um, Boko Haram insurgents or terrorists, depending on your politics, um, in northeastern Nigeria. This tank was purchased legally from BAE Land Systems in the United Kingdom and you know for all intents and purposes was purchased with a completely open and transparent defense deal and then wound up in the hands of what is now the most violent terrorist organization worldwide they have forget about isis Boko Haram has killed more people in the world as a terrorist group than anybody else and that's kind of an alarming thing when you think about the fact that nobody at least on twitter when we found this picture actually knew what on earth this thing was in terms of what the tank was or where it comes from. So immediately you start to see that there is this lack of sort of real specific information about this. And obviously I've seen this in the journalistic sphere as well. People will see a tank and they don't actually understand what specific tank that is. And it's not just a question of nerding out on the sort of technical details, especially if you're, you know, if you're an engineer, you love that kind of stuff, I suppose. Um, it, it, it's important. It's important to know what the details is or are um, in terms of that, that sort of tank. Um, so that tank, even an old tank, even a tank that was purchased 30 years ago by the Nigerian army and completely above board, um, can still become a problem in the modern sort of uh, security environment, say northeast Nigeria, northeastern Nigeria, um, if it falls into enemy hands. It has a 105 millimeter cannon. Um, it has been used in propaganda videos by Boko Haram as sort of firing said cannon. Um, you know, and that's that's an alarming thing when you have a terrorist organization or a, a militant group using a tank. Um, anytime you have a non-state actor using a tank, that's quite alarming. So to take this back to the two silo approach, what I'm going to talk about is how this relates firstly to the state side on the, on the left hand side and then the non-state side um, in the Boko Haram example there on the, um, on the left. So Minesweeper. <laughs> Project Athena and Minesweeper is how we're going to make African military or African Department of Defense organizations um, somewhat accountable or at least somewhat transparent whether or not they like it. It doesn't matter. And the same for sort of some of those global arms importers or exporters providing those uh, sort of systems. Okay. Um, the Minesweeper approach is kind of what we're basing this on because a lot of this information is if it's not um, easily available, it's just really really tricky to find that's not to say it's impossible but it is just really really difficult to find accurate data on what uh, sort of what tanks or what rifles or what bombs are being purchased by what states um, and when and more importantly for how much okay um, so what we're trying to do is gather that research and gather that data um, you know just by sort of you know, steady, diligent, patient research. Um, we all have at ADR, we have an expertise in actually doing this um, for our sins back in the day for the sort of dark side of, uh, you know, sort of uh, for, for profit consultancies. So we have an idea of how to find these procurement uh, sort of lists, tender documents, um, you know, sort of open source uh, news coverage and things like that. There is another database, the CIPRI database, which is a useful sort of bottom water or sort of lower watermark that we can use. Um, which provides some export data for defense things, but not all of it. That tank that I mentioned, for example, is listed in the CIPRI database, but it's not listed as a Mark I, uh, Vickers Mark I Eagle main battle tank. It's just listed as a main battle tank exported to Nigeria in 1981. So now we had to sort of make that research link between, okay, it's a main battle tank, but is it the one we want? Um, that's just an idea of how we're trying to do that. So we're, you know, to take it back to Minesweeper, we're never quite going to get exactly the mine that we want. But we're hoping through Project Athena on the state side of things to eliminate as many of these gray boxes of um, sort of confusion or of lack of transparency on that procurement side um, in order to give you as the researcher or citizen journalist or humanitarian organization um, a better idea um, of what's going on in terms of that sort of defense procurement space. Okay, so what are the flags? How do we know that there's a flag there? You know, what's a corruption risk? Because obviously all militaries buy equipment. You know, we're at ADR, we're not, we're not pacifists. We, we do understand that states are going to buy tanks. They're going to buy aircraft. Um, these things are going to happen. So what is, what, what's the big deal? 
So how to raise those flags is when you start to look at the sort of things such as, for example, underspending or overspending. You know, did that tank cost too much? Did it cost too little? Um, did it arrive f way, way later than it actually was uh, sort of supposed to arrive? All of these things are markers that we, we use to indicate possible risks um, in terms of malfeasance, in terms of misconduct, and in terms of potential corruption. We're, the Project Athena uh, sort of purpose is not to um, say this is a corrupt deal, but it's to create those sort of uh, things around which you can sort of start to raise the flag as a researcher and say, this might be corrupt, let's look into it further. And we're providing that sort of springboard that you can actually look for. Okay. Um, so that's an essential, the, the minesweeper uh, sort of things. I'm really blitzing through this, but uh, we're going to get there. Here's the fun part. Who knows what the hell this is? This is a scratch patch. Does anyone know what it, raise a show of hands, does anybody know what a scratch patch is? Ah, oh, thank you, there's one, thank goodness. I used to think everybody knew what a scratch patch was, but it turns out this is just a sort of artifact of my own childhood memory. Um, a scratch patch is basically a giant um, sort of playground, if you will, um, for people to go into a sort of bed of semi-precious stones and you get a bucket, you pay sort of, uh, I don't forget what the price was, um, and you get to sort of literally scratch around and pick the stones you want um, and sort of put them in your bucket and now you've got your sort of what you at least think are precious stones. They're not precious, they're basically worthless, but you're picking, <laughs> you're picking what you think is, is sort of precious to you. Um, you then take it home and then annoy your parents forever by sort of leaving these things under the sides of couches and that. Um, when we were discussing how do we start looking at the sort of Boko Haram tank, tank side of things, how do we look at weapons that are not cataloged or not announced through an arm, a sort of an arms deal or a procurement deal, how do we start to sort of look at that? And this is how we started to visualize things in terms of a scratch patch and then sort of ran into difficulties explaining that to anyone who wasn't sort of a sort of child in sort of apartheid South Africa as a white South African with access to the scratch patch. Nobody else knew what the hell we were talking about. But now that you know, you're part of it. So welcome. Um, you'll never be able to unsee this. What the scratch patch essentially is, is we're going to be cataloging and gathering as much po uh, possible data that can be found. Social media, um, sort of, you know, by sort of, we do sometimes get tip offs and submissions of what you can see has weapons and, and arms and explosives from captured stockpiles. Um, you know, often on, on social media, you'll see uh, militant groups and rebel organizations themselves post almost as a sort of form of propaganda the, the various weapons they're using. And those are very, very good telltale signs um, for what, uh, what weapons are being used and more importantly where they came from. But this is just the tip of the spear. What we're trying to do with ADR is we're actually sort of planning almost as a bit of a prototype, well it is a prototype, um, is to go to the DRC ourselves. We're sending two researchers in country with the blessing and sort of embed of the, the UN peacekeeping forces there um, with an embed with the South African military and we're going to be stock, or not stockpiling, but we're going to be cataloging armed uh, sort of arms that have been captured or sort of recovered from armed groups um, and sort of start cataloging in terms of what are these weapon types, what are the serial numbers in the barrels, in the receivers, um, and so start looking at the ammunition types, looking at the little stamped sort of serial numbers and that. The reason being is if you have a serial number, you have an idea of where this thing was produced. And you can start to actually track and trace just where these weapons um, sort of came from and more importantly now how they've wound up in sort of a uh, sort of non-state actor's hands. Um, providing, you know, I talked to initially about sort of peeling the lid open on defense transparency. We do that on the state side by defense procurement data. This is how we peel it back from the other side um, by cataloging this data. So we're making this open source. We're going to sort of open it up in terms of crowdsourcing, trying to figure out um, um, you know, if, if the internet can help us. Um, those of you who are aware of Bellingcat, a major sort of OSINT research uh, group, um, have done this to great success in sort of Syria and the U Ukraine as well. Um, so we're kind of hoping to do something similar for um, Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa if we can get enough information on it. So now very briefly in the space of about a minute, 
the tech, which is probably what a lot of you are mostly interested in. Um, this is just a screenshot from the scratch patch side of things, um, where we're looking at sort of trying to map and catalog um, weapon instances and sort of objects as and when and how we gain, uh, sort of gain them. Obviously, when we go to the DRC, we're going to have a big sort of even deeper red color there once we've got a whole bunch of information there. Um, but we're trying to essentially create this searchable um, index for researchers to basically say, I want to know how many Chinese AK pattern uh, assault rifles, for example, have been sighted in Central Africa. Um, that information doesn't exist. It just does not exist, not in any coherent sort of way. So we're trying to actually create that coherent sort of pattern about it. Um, the, the sort of details about it, the sort of stack, obviously our database will be built. Um, we're using a thing called uh, Elasticsearch, um, I think which uses uh, archival and logging information, which is kind of its speciality. Um, so that's gonna be a, a sort of a big help with this stuff, especially with the procurement data, because that's literally just logging and archiving documents. Um, and then using Kibana as the, the, the visual tool uh, from that. So yeah, that's pretty much in a very, very quick uh, sort of nutshell what we're doing with Project Athena. Um, you know, and uh, again, uh, uh, hopefully you guys have got some questions about all of that stuff because I'd love to talk about it some more. Thank you. I mustn't touch it. I saw... Uh, Thank you. I was wondering if you have any pushback from the government or if there's any fear of that or anything like that? Yes. Um, the uh, yes is the answer. Uh, to uh, uh, Where's it gone? Here we go. Uh, this little thing, this isn't just something we found on the internet. This is from a previous project we did where we sent journalists to South Sudan to uncover reports of human engineer or repop human repopulation or human uh, engineering by the South Sudanese government. Um, it's, if you sort of just Google South Sudan African Defense or it's on our website, pretty good story. I think you should all read it. It's great. But anyway, point being is we had hundreds of gigs of footage and data and research in a country where it's illegal to photograph military personnel. Um, it's risky, but at the same time, we encrypted the data, we kept sort of USB um, sticks in our socks, and you just sort of, you, you, you take that risk. With something like the DRC, there's less of a risk because we're kind of doing it at the sort of invitation of the United Nations. So that, that does help a lot. Um, we're not expecting the Nigerian military, for example, to be friends with us you know, if we uncover Nigerian sort of procurement or, you know, talking about that tank, for example. Um, weirdly, we're doing this, you know, we're also focusing on South Africa as a case study as well for this, because South Africa is not, you know, despite, uh, you know, South Africans consider themselves the Texans of Africa. We think we're the biggest thing there and everything, everything else kind of pales in significance. We're kind of like the narcissists of, of the world. But, um, we're taking a look at South Africa because we're not immune to defense corruption either. Um, and we're, we're sort of looking at that. And weirdly, we have got a bit of cooperation, actually, with the, the South African military. Nothing official, um, but, but certainly there's, there's no pushback. Um, we do expect that to kind of change as we go into other, other areas. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you just mentioned that you, Project Athena raises flags for not be and corruption, and you mentioned that you know, you, you check to see what, say, the price was sold, what, you know, how the arms were sold and what, mm. so I was just curious as to, like, how do you, how, how, how does the project know that? So, you will often find, um, that I'm just trying to think of a good example, but something like a, an aircraft, for example, um, I'm thinking of a recent thing we worked on in Angola, where Angola purchased, um, I think it was seven SU. Uh, 32 flankers, something like that, for the princely sum of a billion dollars, which is way too much for that thing. The jets were obsolete and all that. Um, Agola boasted about it. They literally sort of were quite happy to say, hey, we're spending a billion dollars on arms because for them it was a way of projecting military power. Hey, we're spending all this money on military means we're serious about it. Other ways is often defense companies themselves will advertise it. Um, in the case of that tank, for example, um, BAE Land Systems, the producer, is obliged by their country's export law to announce 
their, their export destination and how much they're, they're paying for it. Um, that's not always the case, particularly in sort of um, uh, Russian exporters and Chinese exporters. You often find that data is just more, way more difficult to find. Um, and in that case, uh, that we kind of have to go a little bit further. There's often local blogs where we have to go and use Google Translate to figure out what Russian or Chinese is for this amount of money for this thing. And it's not perfect. It's not accurate, but it's, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, and then we need to sort of extract or sort of compare that to the market cost for that class of weapon, which is generally quite well known within the defense industry. Um, yeah. Sorry, just follow up. Is sure. this automated or are there like people, data curators who do it, it? There are people. There is the, the five of us um, and we have a network of researchers that we're using because it's, it's incredibly niche research um, to be able to sort of know your Mark 1 Vickers from an, uh, you know, sort of T72M from a T72K from, a, you know, it's, it's very difficult research and we, I mean, if, if anybody has any ideas about how to automate it, please come talk to me. <laughs> you will save me so many gray hairs in the future. Yeah. 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 Um, I was just wondering if you are developing using a uh, data standard for modeling all that that you have. Uh, because I can see that mm. would be very useful, I mean, beyond the, the scope of the, the geographic scope that you, you are working on, but yeah. in America with all the war on drugs, for instance, yeah. all the trafficking and so on, even though that information that might not be open <coughs> now, but yeah. it is kept under some standard, so at least mm. it's something, and that people can just look into that and, and kind of... Mm evolve from, from that, I mean, it is available somewhere. Yeah. That's a good question, actually. So we're, we're not project complete just yet. Um, we're hoping to sort of get this ready and rolled out by the, before the end of the year. Um, but actually, as we've been working on this, it's actually South Africa's elections today. I'm South African, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, and we're having our national elections. And we, when we're working on this, we're thinking this would actually be a great tool uh, to visualize elections. Because essentially, instead of, sorry, I'm just trying to flick to it, there we go. You know, instead of tanks and weapons as being the objects, your objects could be voters, they could be constituents, it could be drug dealers in, in South America, there could be um, any kind of sort of object database. Um, and I think to answer your question is yes, we certainly intend to make this available. We are um, in partnership with Code for Africa who generally prefer us to have a GitHub for everything so that you know everyone can sort of take a look-see. I hope I'm answering the sort of tech side. Again, I'm not quite the developer. But the idea is to develop this methodology as we go so that people can use this for other things. Um, we had kind of thought quite narrowly in terms of using it for defense outside of Africa. But there's no reason, if you think about outside the box, why this couldn't be integrated into any number of other similar kinds of uh, sort of projects where you've got procurement and you've got things that are related to procurement, but perhaps sort of a bit off the books, as it were. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. I don't know. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I have two questions. Um, one is, why the name Project Athena? It, it, it seems like to be like quite overloaded and it doesn't seem super relevant to a yeah. Greek guide to, to African uh, homelands or whatever. Um, and two, a lot of this data you're talking about has a statistical like variance to it. It's not 100%, right? So you're pulling an image off Twitter that that may, is posted by somebody who might be related to some um, entity that might be the thing you're looking at. Mm. And I wonder if you've thought about how to relate that in your visualizations and, and how you explain this to the public. So. I mean, mm. having worked in defense data in the past, I've always been very careful to say, like, this is a weapon from this group at this mm. point. And I see a lot of assertions like that in your talk. I'm just curious yeah. how you um, talk about that. Certainly. So um, I'm glad you asked about the Athena name. Um, our initial preference was actually for Oya, which is an African goddess of war and conflict and things like that. Um, but the idea is for this tool to be used sort of internationally. Um, and the sad thing is it's just Athena is a far more relatable, you know, sort of understandable term than uh, Oya, unfortunately. Um, Oya we've used now for another mapping tool that we've got. Um, I, I would love to change it and it's, it's not set in stone. So we might, depending, depending how we feel as we go further on, actually sort of, because we actually wanted to, I should say that, but we're also trying to get this tool as widely used as possible. Um, so it's, it's kind of a catch, well it's not a catch 22, it's just a sort of cost benefit that we've sort of 
sort of decided to do on the data um, absolutely agreed it's uh, you know especially you know when I you know I am a journalist by day as well for for normal political stuff and we when we're not being hacked by the Russians encounter sort of fake imagery and stuff like that as well um, and I would say as, in as, as much as social media is related um, it's f sort of human filtered as it were you know we have the five of us we're hoping I did mention crowdsourcing but perhaps only too briefly um, to adopt a sort of Bellingcat kind of model here where we sort of open this up to citizen researchers and say can you geolocate or, or sort of reference or sort of verify that this is actually this assault rifle from this area. Uh, in the case of the DRC, that will be our own primary research. Um, so that at least we, we can use as a kind of like control study for the because obviously we want to have as clean a start as possible um, in, in running this sort of project. So we would like to have as sort of pure kind of research and material as possible. So our catalog image of an assault rifle um, could for all intents and purposes be a tweet because it's, hey, from this location, this picture with this description, we're just doing that ourselves instead of putting it on social media. But the fields and objects that we would put into Athena in terms of the database would be more or less similar. Um, but then obviously as we go out, information gets less perfect and then scrutiny needs to be a little bit more uh, sort of rigorous, I think, as we go. Okay, yeah, we'll see the question speaker. Um, so please forgive me if this is if, if this is a very sort of naive question. If you just abandoned kind of worries about like logistics and funding and all of the work that you have to do, because this is a massive amount of work, it's really impressive. <laughs> what what would be like the dream pathway to impact? Like if you if I asked you to just be like like just imagine like the best case scenario for this mm. project. What, who would pay attention and, and what would they do as a result? I mean, honestly, in a perfect world, it would, it would be if we could change this from Project mm -hmm. Athena to... Uh, I thought it was me with that microphone. Change it from Project Athena to Wiki Weapons, you know, and turn it into a sort of Wikipedia level kind of thing where you have active sort of citizen engagement and contribution to this, this knowledge. Because it's, it's, it's our firm belief, the whole reason we're doing this aside from, well not aside, it's not, the primary thing is not to nerd out on weapons. The primary reason we're doing this is because we, we genuinely believe this information needs to be made open source. It needs to be uh, sort of opened up and made public domain. Whereas at the moment it absolutely is not. Um, and that's, that's the sort of mission we're trying to do. This, you know, you mentioned funding and effort. This is what we can do right now. But again, in a perfect world, if we had more, more sort of hands on deck and a little bit more funding and things like that, yeah, Wiki Weapons would be great. Also a cool name as well, I suppose. Yeah. I think that's all we got for questions. Mm -hmm. So let's take the speaker. Thank you.